I'm going to try and show you how we can obtain the, the size of the event horizon of a black hole with using no more than school-based maths. As a theoretical physicist, it's what you do. When you first think about doing a calculation, you don't plunge straight in and, and start in trying to solve some very, very complicated set of differential equations. What you tend to do initially is you do what is called a dimensional analysis. You look at the units and, and you try and understand what, what do I expect the answer to look at in terms of units. And that often gives you a real handle on what this solution should look like. It can be very powerful. When you're marking exams, actually, it's a really good way of finding where a student has made a mistake by looking back and finding where the units don't work out. If you have an equation that says x equals y, then you don't think of x as being meters and y as being kilograms. You don't say, this person's six meters tall, they must be the same as this person over here who's six kilograms. You've got to have the same units on either side of an equation. And it's as simple as that. It, that's the basic idea behind this but you can actually make some real progress and we'll, we'll, we'll reach the black hole, but on the way we'll do Kepler's laws, <laughs> which is one of the things we teach in second year uh, classical mechanics course as a solving a rather complicated differential equation. We'll kind of get to the, the nub of it. All right, Ed, and if I don't like it, do you know where it's going to end up? It's going in, in the... Confidential waste. <laughs> oh. I'm going to put it in your confidential waste bin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So Where do we start? I guess we start with the title. Dimensional analysis. There's a nice blog post that does something along these lines by a very good theoretical physicist called Matt Strasner. Link in the description. So the idea is the following, right? We, we, we're going to use units, or in particular the consistency of units, to try and glean information about a problem and its likely solution. And it's remarkably powerful. Imagine you've got the sun and we've got the earth going around the sun, okay? And it's got some typical radius, r, and it's got some associated period, the time for it to go around, t. And you can ask, what's the average velocity? What would be the possible equation that relates velocity to the radius and the time? Well, everyone's going, this is silly, right? We know velocity is distance over time. And so it's going to be some possible number times the, the radius divided by the time. And it can't be anything else. It can't be r squared divided by t, because that would have units of kilometers squared divided by seconds. It wouldn't be a velocity. So this is the first example of a dimension Dimensional analysis giving me some information. And it turns out in almost all situations that we deal with, this number re usually becomes a, a number of order one. So we might not be bang on because the, the, the value will depend, you know, if this was a circle, that would be two pi, right? Because the circumference would be two pi r. And if it was an ellipse, it would be something slightly different. But this number will typically be something of order one. And that's a common thing that will come out. It won't be a billion or a billionth. But now I want to go and, and move on to Kepler, right? Kepler's laws. One of his most famous laws relates the radius to the time with this rather weird relationship, that the radius cubed is proportional to the time squared. Or, if I divide by them out, it tells me that the radius cubed divided by the period squared must be some constant. And this is true of all the planets, you know, whether it's Mercury, all the way out to Uranus or Neptune. Oh, you didn't go for Pluto. I am going for Pluto. I didn't know whether you'd let me go for it, but I am going for Pluto. Pluto's in there, right? It's, <laughs> I can't let go of Pluto. I know Mike doesn't. He's a bit more hard-nosed about it. And it's true of the moon going around the Earth as well. So I thought maybe we'd try and show this using what I hope will be standard formula that people will remember. So the only thing I want you to assume is our local hero, well, one of our two local heroes. We've got George Green, who's our really local hero, but we'll thought Manor is no more than about 30 miles away from here, so Newton's hours. So we'll assume Newton's laws. If I have two objects, let's call it m and little m, and they're a distance r apart, Newton told us that the force of attraction between those objects was some constant, Newton's constant, times big M times little m over r squared. So I can rearrange this. It's units that I'm going to be interested in. So I can rearrange this, right? So this is just g is f r squared over big M times little m. But there's one more equation 
What about, the, what about f? Well, possibly the most famous equation alongside e equals mc squared is f equals ma. We learned that at school. Mass of the object times acceleration. But what's acceleration? In terms of units, this becomes the mass. I'm going to use these square brackets here to say we're talking about units. That's the mass. And what's acceleration? Kilometers per second squared, for example. So it's distance over time squared. So now I can ask about the dimension of g the units of g, so but I put in the units here, right? So I get the units of g and it becomes, let's say it's mass times, and then there's a length here, but there's also a length squared there from the radius. So we'll call that length cubed divided by, on the bottom here we've got two masses, so it's like a mass squared, and in fact one of these, this mass actually cancels. These two little m's are the same, they cancel one another. And that's why we've got that there. And then we've got the time squared from here. So this is times t squared. So this then becomes L cubed over, and it's actually this big mass that's left, and it's times t squared. And all of the orbits that we're talking about are going around the same object, so this object of mass m. And so if I bring the mass over to this side, I have g times m is actually L cubed over t squared. And the mass of the smaller object doesn't even matter. Doesn't matter. The mass of the smaller object doesn't matter. And, and so, you know, this is, for example, the sun of mass m. And so this is the, the relationship that comes from Kepler's law. There'll be some number here, because when you've done the actual calculation, there'll be some number. So what you actually get is, you know, the, the units of g times m is actually going to be some number times, and l for us is, is the radius, and the time is the period. So for a given m, then all the objects have the same value of r cubed over t squared that are going around it. What we've effectively done here is we've, we've kind of guessed Kepler's law without solving some equation which is telling me about... When you solve for Kepler's law, you, you've got to solve for an angle that's going around and it's a differential equation, you've got to do changes of variables, it's, it's quite a complicated thing. But you've got the, the, the nub of the problem just, just there. And so we've effectively guessed Kepler's law and we've done it from dimensional analysis, which I think is nice. And in fact, we've got this unknown number here and we've got g, which we haven't said what its value is. But actually, it turns out if you're interested in ratios of things, then you actually can still make a lot of progress. Imagine that I've got the following that instead I think of both the Earth going around the Sun, but I'm also thinking about the Moon going around the Earth. Not necessarily got my length scales very good here, but the Earth is going around the Sun and the Moon is going around the Earth. And in each case then, I've got an equation that's something like says g times the mass of the Sun is equal to some number times the radius of the Earth to the Sun cubed divided by the period of the Earth, which is a year, of course, squared, right? And we know what the radius is. We've also got g times the mass of the Earth is the same number, times the radius of the Moon to the Earth, cubed, divided by the period of the Moon to the Earth, which is, what, it's about a month, right? Look what happens if, if I divide one by the other, this unknown number cancels and the g cancels. And I'm left with a rather nice formula which says that the mass of the Sun divided by the mass of the Earth is equal to, and it's this ratio, it's the radius of the Earth-Sun divided by the Moon-Earth cubed, and then actually it's this is the other way around, it's the period of the Moon-Earth divided by the period of the Earth-Sun squared. Well, I know these numbers, right? I can measure these numbers. And when you do it, you get that this is a number of order 325,000. In other words, I've estimated the mass of the Sun compared to the mass of the Earth without knowing anything about it. You just had to know the radiuses and the times. I just needed times. to know the radiuses and the times. Okay. And, and, you know, I've just used dimensional analysis for it. Knowing the radiuses was a feat in itself, though. No, yeah, I mean, I'm being, being flippant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's not, not easy to, to, to determine the, the radius, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's true. All right. That's Kepler. All right. let, let me just mention one that um, is probably the most famous equation of all time, but just to remind people 
that maybe you're, pre- you're pretty liberal with most famous yes. equation of all time, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm waiting for my own. <laughs> there, are lo- there are lots of most famous <laughs> equations of all time. What's this most famous? This one's e equals mc squared. But okay, maybe, that maybe, is the maybe, most famous equation of all time. <laughs> but, but what I want to um, sort of g- 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 give a flavour for is that maybe people, when they first saw it, might be really surprised. But perhaps they shouldn't have been, based on dimensional analysis. Because I want to re- just remind people that at school, when we're learning about energy, we learn what kinetic energy is, right? We learn that the kinetic energy of an object of mass m moving with a velocity v is equal to a half m v squared. Most famous equation of all time. The most famous <laughs> equation of all time. And <laughs> But this now tells me, immediately tells me, right, that the units of energy here, because it's an equation, the units have got to be the same. So we pretend we don't know what the units of energy are, but we do know what the units of this are. We've got the mass, so that's got a unit of mass. And we've got velocity, which has got units of length over time. So this has got units of L squared divided by T squared. And the question is, where the physics comes in is, if I want to get this relationship here, E equals mc squared. We, which, of course, has those units, right? That's the point that I'm sort of driving at. It, we, we shouldn't be surprised that it's of the form a mass times a velocity squared, because that is the only thing that will have the correct units. Now, what we can be surprised about is that speed of light, and we might be surprised that the number is 1. That we can't pluck out. So why isn't it, say, the speed of sound? Or why isn't it, you know, some other speed, like the speed of, 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 of a, a, you know, a traveling car or something? Why is that a fundamental object? Because we, we think of this as a very fundamental thing. And that, of course, is where Einstein's brilliance came in. I mean, if you were going to guess any speed that it was going to be, you, surely you would guess the speed of light, because it's such a fundamental thing in the universe. Whereas every, yeah. like the cars and the speed of sound are, are moving feasts. Yeah, you're very good. Okay, yeah. all right. I mean, I just don't give up. I mean, hindsight. <laughs> I, would have, I would have got that equal <laughs> I would have figured that in no time. I mean, you're, you're, you're bang on right. I mean, Maxwell is the guy who was the one who linked it to electromagnetism, right? He realised when he was doing his phenomenal equations, there was this fundamental speed emerging, which was the speed of light, of massless particles. So it, it was clear that there was something in there, you know, the natural thing, as you said, linking it to light and linking it to electromagnetism. It was actually Einstein that really pinned down this because he, he demonstrated through his theory of a special relativity that, that this, was a, this was a cosmic speed limit, that you just couldn't pa- have information going faster than this speed. And so it was an upper speed limit that was there, a natural one. And so it was natural that, that Einstein would have this coming out. And in fact, it's really neat in, in his paper. It's a very short paper. You know, 1905 was a phenomenal year, right, for Einstein with some like six papers, all of which were Nobel Prize winning type things. This was a short paper he wrote. And, and what he basically said was, if there is a, if you have an, a, a, an object with a mass M that loses radiation, the amount of radiation it will lose in light is is this. Its, its mass will decrease by this amount. I mean, and, and in here, of course, is a phenomenal statement about the, the, the amount of energy for a small mass. Because we know in, in units of meters per second, the speed of light is like 3 times 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. So square it, you've got a factor of 10 to the 18 multiplying. So the speed of light wasn't quite such a big deal until it equals MC yeah, squared. Yeah, I, I right? think that's right. I think, yeah. that, uh, I think Maxwell and, and others realised there was something special about it through the electromagnetism, and it plays such a crucial role. But it was Einstein linking it to space and time and the evolution of space and time that, that was the big breakthrough. Oh, are you getting us to black holes? Yeah, I'm, we're on oh, black holes. You got there quicker than I thought. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't mess around, Brady. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm <laughs> you not, mess around a bit. I'm, <laughs> Yeah. All right. Known for my uh, rapid speed. So here we go. Black holes, right? So what am I going to do? Are we going to do a big course in general relativity? No, we're going to do it via dimensional analysis. And we're going to do it via the escape velocity. One of the things we learn at school, calculating the escape velocity. How fast would a projectile have to be sent from the Earth in order for it to go into orbit? Before, before we did this video, we spent a great few minutes looking at Apollo films. I guess like everybody else that just arrived, or all three of us are plastered to the windows looking. Because we're a bit geeky that way. You are anyway, for sure. And 
and that had to have an escape velocity, right? And, and so that's what we're going to try and do, and, and from it end up with a, a remarkable close approximation, dimensionally perfectly correct, to the event horizon of a black hole. Okay, that's where we're going. So let's estimate it, and we'll estimate it for an object of mass m, so that's going to be like your Earth, and of a radius r, so that's like the Earth or the... Remember earlier we saw the units of, of, of Newton, of Newton's constant, we said it's, it's got units of L cubed over mass times T squared, and that means that G, M, if I multiply it by the mass, has units of L cubed over T squared. You might think, what are you doing? What are you playing at? I'm going to get us to, remember, I'm doing dimensional analysis. I want to get us to a velocity. That's what I want us to get to. Look if I divide out by, say, the radius G, M, over r, a radius has got dimensions of length. I'm left on the right hand side with something that's got dimensions of l over t squared. That's a velocity squared. I've got a velocity squared out of these, these combinations of the mass of the object, the radius of the object, and Newton's constant. So this is consistent. So, so I, can, I can say, oh, there's some relationship, which I'll call the escape velocity, which is some number, which I don't know, but I'm, I'm estimating it, uh, it will something be of order one times by this combination, g m over r. Okay, let's look at this just for a moment. Let's remind ourselves what we're looking at. We're looking at an object of some mass m and some radius r. And we're asking, there's little you on your would-be rocket, desperate to get out and up. And you will need to know what's your escape velocity to get off and out into orbit or out into space. One thing to notice, as r decreases, for a given mass, as I shrink this object, this velocity increases. So as r decreases, then it leads to VE increases for a fixed, that's important, right? For a fixed mass. And, and a natural question to ask is, what size would this object have to be in order for it to not allow light to go? Instead of you, it was light. How big would that be? And this was... And light can only have one velocity. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what about light? I keep the mass fixed and just shrink it down. Light's got a velocity that we know. So we know that light has a velocity of c. So what we can do is we can rearrange this equation here to write down what the radius will be. r is equal to some number times g m over c squared. And this was first spotted by John Mitchell and independently by Laplace, Pierre Simon Simon, is it? Laplace. And the remarkable thing is this was done in 1784 by John Mitchell and 1796. So this is the radius beyond which light couldn't escape from this object. It's not a black hole, it's just an object that you've just found the radius for a given mass that's too big for anything that wants to move at the speed of light to get away. It's a black stone, if you like, or a black planet or something. And the, you can sort of put in some numbers, right? If I put in the mass of the Earth, this would give me a radius of around two to three centimetres, golf ball type of size. Okay. If it was the mass of the sun, it would be a radius of around a few kilometres, around two kilometres or so. And below that size, light couldn't escape. This remarkably, right, this gm over, um, r over c squared is, up to a factor of two, the size of the event horizon of what's called the Schwarzschild black hole. And it was discovered by, it's a solution to Einstein's general theory of relativity. It's, and it's an object that light cannot escape from. If, if light ends up, anything that ends up within that radius of the singularity of the black hole, that light from it can't escape. You can emit a photon and it will never be able to escape. And the actual size, is just a factor of two difference. So in Einstein's general theory of relativity, which you know was about 1915, he found, or actually he didn't know about the existence of this until Schwarzschild found it, that you have a black hole with what's called the Schwarzschild radius, which is 2 gm over c squared, where you know c is our universal speed limit. So Ed, if we crunch the Earth down to less than you know two or three centimeters yeah. in, in size, it's, it wouldn't be a black hole yet. Not, not this one, no, yeah. But it would. But light wouldn't be able to escape. Light wouldn't be able to escape. You could go up to it and you'd, it'd be black. <laughs> be careful of the step. 
Wow. Well, I've calmed down a bit now, Brady, and I think I can begin to talk about it. 